Because there are things that happen in our own lives that when they happen, we can't see God. We can't see the hand of God in them. We wonder, are we alone? Has God abandoned us? And Joseph has been living with these feelings since he was sold as a slave into Egypt. And when the Iron Curtain was drawn across Europe, people felt trapped behind the walls of communism. We, there were incredible stories who were of people who were eventually able to escape the throes of communism for, and come to the West. And occasionally there would be a news report of showing these families being reunited with each other, having been separated for years. And if you look at those pictures, oh, they are a thousand words of arms open wide, people running to greet each other, holding on to each other, not wanting to let go because they've been separated for so long. Dancing, screaming, tears of joy. Those of you that are in my generation will remember uh, Clark on Clark Air Force Base in February 1973 when 143 brave men who were POWs held in Vietnam were released and found their way back to the United States. One such man was Naval Captain Jeremiah Denton. And as he began to speak, he got so choked up that he was home. He's looking over at his family. His wife, his kids are just wanting to embrace him. Finally, he just said, God bless America, walked away, and there in the middle of the picture, his kids and family run to him. They had not seen him in eight years. And when we look at pictures like that, sometimes they're so sacred, so undescribable that you cannot analyze them objectively because the emotions are so strong in those pictures. People who've been struggling for years, will I see my husband, my father again? Now finally reunited or overwhelmed with such joy and emotion. Reminded me of a hymn writer named Fanny Crosby, who wrote this line in her hymn, Rescue the Perishing, chords that are broken vibrate once more. And in our story today, we are picking up where Joseph will finally get to see all of his brothers at one time. He has not seen them all together in 20 years. If you remember, he's kind of testing them, making them think he believes they're spies. He put the money, had the money put back in their sacks to go home. On the way home, they discovered the money's there. It scares them to death. They don't know why it's there. This would only reinforce his suspicion that they are spies. But he kept one of their brothers, Simeon, in prison and said, you go home. You return with your youngest brother, Benjamin, and I will release Simeon to you. Benjamin was his only biological brother. Same father, same mother. The other ten brothers had a different father and a different mother. He desperately wants to see his father and his youngest brother. So today what I want to look at is how do we write ruptured relationships for the glory of Jesus Christ. So let's look at this. First way is we do what the brothers did. We act swiftly and humbly to be reconciled. There has to be an intentionality on our part to move fast. Look at Genesis 43, 15. So the men took the gifts and the double the amount of silver and Benjamin also. They hurried down to Egypt and presented themselves to Joseph. As I said, they get home, they open their sacks and realize the money's not only been returned to us, it's been doubled. So why do these 10 brothers, why do they act swiftly and humbly to get back to Joseph to prove that they're not spies and to get their other brother free. First, they need to show their good faith. They need to prove that they're not spies. They need to ransom Samson, and they need to buy more food. The famine is going to come back and hit them again. The Hebrew word that's translated as they heard down is jarad. It's often used of something happening very fast. It's also used of, to refer to someone who died very suddenly. We will say he just dropped dead. Okay. It's also the word used in the book of Exodus, where Moses tells Pharaoh that after the death of every firstborn son in Egypt, then Pharaoh and his servants will act swiftly to kneel before the God of the Hebrews. In the last few weeks, we have seen that these brothers have been dealing with guilt for 20 years. They have never escaped the guilt of selling their brother as a slave. And it's been eating on them and eating on them. We saw last week and we're going to see today. They think all of these events are God's punishment on them for doing that very act. They cannot escape it. They believe God is about to right a wrong that they did. 
So they are consumed with guilt. It's weighed heavily on their shoulders. And they have not been able to escape it for 20 years. You see, when there is a ruptured relationship, God wants us to act swiftly and humbly to rectify it. Now let me give you four biblical reasons why you and I, if we know that someone in our fellowship of faith has a problem with us, why we are to take the initiative first. Not them, but us. Let me give you four reasons. First, it's commanded by Jesus. It's commanded by Jesus that if you are here today and you know someone in this church, you have an issue with them. You're not speaking to them. You don't want to talk to them. You're trying to avoid them. Then you're commanded by Jesus to take the initiative first and go make things right. Look at this. Jesus said if you enter your place of worship and you suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you, leave immediately. Go to this friend and make things right. Then and only then come back and work things out with God. Jesus said if you're here even today, before you go eat, you need to rectify this now. That denotes swift action. Leave immediately, he said. Swallow your pride, go humbly, and talk things out. Here's the second reason you and I are to take the initiative. God will not forgive my sins until I've obeyed him in this. We're all going to need our future forgiven. Again, look at the words of Jesus in Matthew 6. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive you your sins. See, any ruptured relationship is due to sin. You cannot get God's forgiveness for your sin if you know you have a ruptured relationship with another sister or brother in Christ. You can't be reconciled to God until you've been reconciled to them. And you may be sitting there thinking, well, it's not my fault. I didn't do this. They embarrassed me. Uh, it's all their fault. Why should I be the one to take the initiative? Because it's commanded, and you can't get your future sins forgiven if you don't. Here's a third reason. I am more like Jesus Christ. We are to imitate our founder, Jesus Christ. He was beaten. He was scourged. He was spit upon. He was nailed to a cross. He was crucified. He was mocked. Had he done anything wrong? No. But he took the, the initiative from the cross to say this in Luke's gospel. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. See, your goal, my goal as people of faith is to be like Christ. And when we're, we're most like Christ, when we forgive people who have offended us, who have hurt us. Here's the fourth reason. It proves the gospel has power. It proves that the gospel has power. I've had more people tell me in my life and ministry, I will never go back to church. Why? It's the biggest gossip place on the planet of the earth. You people can't even get along. All you do is fight and go form new churches. You fight and split and go form new churches. How can I be convinced the gospel's true if you folks can't get along? That's a valid point. When we can't get along, it destroys the power of the gospel. The gospel is God loves you so much he offers you forgiveness. And in turn, we're to offer each other that same forgiveness. Jesus said this in John 13, 35. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. Notice he didn't say your attendance at church will prove your that you love God. He didn't say how much money you give to the church will prove. He didn't say how much you serve the church would prove. Our love for each other is proof to the world that the gospel is authentic. That's the proof. That's the proof. See, the greatest demonstration of God's love is the gift of forgiveness and reconciliation. That's our greatest message. I read a story about Sam Moffat, who's currently a uh, professor at Princeton University. He was a missionary in China when the communists in Mayo took over. The communists seized his house, his possessions. They burned the missionary compound, killed some of his closest missionary friends, their family, and their children. He said they got out of China with nothing but their very lives. He said, when we got back to the States, my heart was filled with resentment towards Mayo and the communists. He said he was teaching a class about the love of God, and he was so overwhelmed about the truth of Jesus that we are to forgive. He said, I realize that if I have no forgiveness for the communists, then I have no gospel message at all. And that's the truth. Some of you will remember who Patty Davis is. In the early 1980s, her father 
was President Ronald Reagan. And there was this buildup of arms between us and the former Soviet Union, if you remember, a race arms. And she opposed it publicly. She made public statements condemning her father for doing this. Patty's mother was appalled and pleaded with her to tone down the rhetoric, and she would not. Years later, she admitted she was wrong about all of that. But every time her father, President Reagan, begged her to sit down with him and let's just talk father and daughter, her response was, I already know what you're going to say and no. She said she could tell her refusal to do that wounded her daddy deeply. She said that in 1982, she was invited to the Rose Bowl. It was filled with 100,000 protesters. And she was to be one of the keynote speakers to speak out against the arms race. She said while she sat there, everything in her told her, don't go to the podium. Don't make the speech. Walk away. But she refused to do that. She said later in life, her mother called her to say that her father had Alzheimer's. She writes this. I would look into my father's eyes and try to reach past the murkiness of Alzheimer's with my words, my apologies. I repeatedly said to my daddy, Daddy, I'm sorry. Daddy, I'm sorry. Hoping that somewhere in his heart he heard me and understood. She says, I wish that now, all those years ago, I had led with kindness, not with ideological stridency. We are, after all, remembered in the end for how we treat each other. Sometimes the political has to be tempered by the personal. I wish I'd acted swiftly and humbly to be reconciled to my father before it was way too late. Please, she says, don't do that with the people you love. It may be too late by the time you try. The clock is ticking. Do not wait until it's too late. We have no gospel message if we can't forgive each other. We have no power in the gospel if we can't forgive each other. So in our story in Genesis 43, you can take your Bibles and turn there. We're going to see how quickly this shifts for Joseph and his brothers, this forgiveness that's going to well up in him towards them, and how God's going to work in this scene. He has been wondering, what will be the result when they find out who I am? His brothers have been wondering, why does this prime minister of Egypt want us to come back and dine with him? I wonder if we'll ever see our brother Simeon again. I wonder if he will imprison all of us because he thinks we're spies. So there's a lot of tension in our story today between Joseph and his brothers. They do not know who he is. Why? He's dressed like an Egyptian. Makeup, garb, he's speaking Egyptian. He's going through a translator to speak Hebrew to them. They have no idea it's him. No idea. So to make a rupture relationship right for the glory of Jesus Christ, number two, release my fears to God through faith. I have to release these fears. You're going to have fears about, all right, so what if I take the initiative? What's going to happen? There's a lot of fear in this. I understand that. It was for Joseph. Look at Genesis 43, 16 through 17. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the manager of his household, These men will eat with me this noon. Take them inside the palace, then go slaughter an animal and prepare a big feast. So the man did as Joseph told him and took them into the Joseph's palace. Now what's amazing here, we've been looking at, there is a seven-year famine going on. To go slaughter an animal was a huge sacrifice. And he says, prepare a big feast meaning a luxurious feast. Now, if you were invited to someone's house and you smelled steaks cooking on the grill, would you be pleased with that? Would you, want, would you love that aroma? You see, the aroma of steaks, mm, it gets our attention. Just like now, I can tell some of you are turning back going, mm, all that food in there. It gets our attention. You see, for Joseph's brothers, fear only increased their unresolved guilt. Unresolved grudges, guilt, and animosity always magnifies anxiety. It always will. It causes you to be very suspicious. It causes you to be very judgmental. It causes you to try to judge people's actions without knowing all the truth. 
And this is the brothers. They're going to begin. We're going to see question his motives here. Look at verse 18. The brothers were terrified when they saw that they were being taken into Joseph's house. Now notice what it says. Listen. Listen to their fear. It's because of the money someone put in our sacks last time we were here. So they're already overwhelmed with fear. They don't believe for one moment the invitation to dine with him is authentic. They don't believe that the smell of steaks cooking is just for them. They're thinking, why would the prime minister do this? Obviously, he is setting a trap for us. He's going to toy with us. He's going to taunt us. And we're being punished by God for what we did 20 years ago. Guilt oozes from every pore and magnifies their anxiety. William Shakespeare in King Henry VI states, Suspicion always haunts the guilty mind. We see this in the brothers. Look at the last part of verse 18. They said, he plans to pretend we stole it. Then he will seize us and make us slaves and take our donkeys. They're paralyzed by guilt. They're paralyzed by fear. They're paralyzed by this anxiety and paranoia. Guilt causes them to say and do strange things that they otherwise would never have thought or said. (laughs) Chuck Swindoll tells a story about a man who lived under guilt for a year. He sent a letter to the Internal Revenue Service, and here's what the man wrote. Dear sirs, I haven't been able to sleep because last year when I filled out my income tax report, I deliberately misrepresented my income. I am enclosing a check for $150, (laughs) and if I I still cannot sleep, I'll send you the rest. (laughs) You see, guilt increases anxiety. Guilt increases will do a number on you. There's lots of medical evidence out there how guilt causes all kinds of diseases and illnesses in our bodies. They fear the worst. And they began, their imagination kicks in, and they begin to think this is the end for them. Now look at verses 19 through 22. The brothers approached the, man, the manager of Joseph's household and spoke to him at the entrance of the palace. Sir, they said, We came to Egypt once before to buy food, but as we were returning home, we stopped for the night and opened our sacks. Then we discovered that each man's money, the exact amount paid, was in the top of his sack. Here it is. We have brought it back with us. We also have additional money to buy more food. We have no idea who put our money in our sacks. You hear them? They're trying, look, here's the money. We didn't steal it. We're not spies. We brought it back to prove we didn't do this. We have no idea how it got there. They're trying to be as tactful and prove their innocence as much as they can. So they confess their guilt. Get this. They confess their guilt to an Egyptian who has no idea what they did 20 years ago and has nothing to do about it. They're eaten up with guilt. They literally want to set the record straight, even if it means telling someone they don't know. In 1993, a Ku Klux Klansman named Henry Alexander made a confession to his wife. In 1957, he and several other Klansmen had pulled a black truck driver from his cab, marched him to a deserted bridge above a swift river, and made him jump, screaming to his death. Alexander was charged with the crime in 1976, but it took 20 years to bring him to trial. He had an all-white jury that acquitted him of the crime. But for 36 years, he insisted on his innocence until one day in 1993 when he confessed the truth to his wife. He said to her, I don't even know what God has planned for me. I don't even know how to pray for myself. You see, he was eaten up with a terminal illness. He knew his time on this earth was about to come to an end, and he was going to meet his maker. She wrote a book about it. She said this to the New York Times. Henry lived a lie all of his life, and he made me live it too. For all those years, she had believed her husband's protest of innocence. He showed no outward sign of remorse until the end was near. She says this, after 36 years of fierce denial, he still needed the release only forgiveness could provide. To right a ruptured relationship, you have to take the initiative to offer the overture, let's make this right. Now, here's the third thing you do. You look for God's hand of grace in this process to free you from your guilt. Look at Genesis 43, 23. Relax. Don't be afraid, the manager said. Your God, the God of your father, must have put this treasure into your sacks. I know I have received your payment. Then he released Simeon and brought him out to them. Then he just says, don't sweat this. It's no big deal. 
He, if you could read Hebrew, he actually uses the Hebrew word for peace, shalom. In fact, when he uses the word God for them, he uses the Hebrew word Elohim, which is the Hebrew word for God that means the God of all gods, the most powerful God, the God that created everything, the God of not just Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of all things, including Egypt. Put this money back in your sack. That's pretty good for a pagan Egyptian. The point is, if you have some grudge or animosity against anyone, especially another believer, instead of gossiping about it to someone else, Take the initiative, do what God says, do what Jesus said in the first things I showed you. Go get reconciled. See, Joseph's brother had never thought to relate the return of the money to the abundant grace of God. Why? Because guilt and animosity keeps us from seeing God's hand of grace in our lives. Unresolved forgiveness keeps us from seeing God's unmerited grace in our lives. God's unmerited favor in our lives. They have no idea this was by the hand of God. And so a pagan Egyptian tells them, your God was gracious to you and gave it back to you. And here's the good news. God's not going to leave you all out there by yourself if you take the initiative to go do this. Because God wants reconciliation. Think about it. Forgiveness for us to take the initiative is one of the most unnatural things for us. We'll buckle down. It's not my fault. It's their fault. I'll never take the overture. I'll never offer the initiative. And when you're like that, you're more like the devil himself than you are Jesus Christ. Because Jesus took the initiative from the cross to offer us forgiveness before we ever came to him and asked for it. Helmut Thickley, he was a German theologian who posed Hitler and Nazis. He says this, the business of forgiving is by no means a simple thing. We say, very well, if the other fellow is sorry and begs my pardon, I will forgive him, and then I'll give in. He says, we have a tendency to make forgiveness an act of reciprocity. The other fellow has to take the first step, and then I will concede. He says, I'm always, in, always on the point of forgiving, but I never forgive. He said, the lesson of forgiveness is taking the initiative. Instead of waiting for the other person to make the first move, I should move because God's grace has moved for me first in their life and in my life. We need to get beyond, as people of faith, this law of reciprocity. We need to become a church that's a church that lives by the law of grace with each other. In this church, you can't bring this number of people together that's not going to have a spat every once in a while or a disagreement every once in a while. I mean, let me just see for a show of hands. How many of you, husband and wives, been driving the church, had an argument in the car? About all of us. You walk in the door, people say, how you doing? Oh, we're doing, bro. we're doing great. Praise the Lord, I'm here. Thank Jesus. But in the car, ah! you, you can't bring two people together and there not be a spat every once in a while. My philosophy is if two people agree on everything, one of them's not needed. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. So let's be a church of grace. Because people are going to hurt your feelings, sometimes intentionally, but most of the time unintentionally. Give them grace. Why? Because you're going to need God's grace in your life later. Number four, release my emotions to God. In Genesis 43, look at verses 24 through 26. The manager led them, led them in into Joseph's palace. He gave them water to wash their feet and provided food for their donkeys. They were told they would be eating there, so they prepared the gifts for Joseph's arrival at noon. When Joseph came home, they gave him gifts that they had brought him. They bowed low to the ground before him. So this manager tries to stress that you're not in trouble here. Nobody's going to punish you. Uh, the prime minister literally wants to have a meal with you. And you've got to realize, they're thinking, why? We're just simple shepherds. We're not royalty. We're, we're not men of power. So think about this. They're going to offer very simple gifts to a man who already has everything he ever wants or needs. Joseph lives in a palace of opulence and wealth. They can't give him anything he needs except their relationship. They offer him simple gifts of grace. Now look at verse 27 through 28. After greeting them, 
He asked, how is your father, the old man you spoke about? Is he still alive? Yes, they replied. Our father, your servant, is alive and well. And they bowed low again. So they can tell at this point, Joseph's not going to punish them. He's not being harsh. He's actually inquiring about their family. He's overjoyed at seeing all of them, including his biological brother, Benjamin. So he says, how you fellas been? You got to think about it. This is a travel to go from Egypt back to where they lived and back again is 400 miles one way. You don't walk 400 miles in a day. It takes months to get there and months to get back. So in the process, their minds, their suspicion, their paranoia has been brewing. What's, what's going on here? What's God doing to us? What's this man going to do? Is he going to let Simeon out or he's going to throw us all in prison? And so they say, yes, our father's doing well. And we learn later they tell him. In Genesis 47, Jacob is over 100 years old. They still are suspicious of Joseph. Then comes one of those rare moments that defies description, like children running across a tarmac to greet a father they hadn't seen in eight years. Look at verse 29. Then Joseph looked at his brother Benjamin, the son of his own mother. Is this your youngest brother, the one you told me about? Joseph asked, may God be gracious to you, my son. So he looks around the room, he sees Benjamin standing there, and he addresses him as my son. As I said, ten of the brothers are from a different father. They have the same father, but a different mother. Only Joseph and Benjamin have the same father and the same mother. Here's what I've learned is that when people are under stress, they often say some of the strangest things. For example, former New York City Mayor David Dinkins answering reporters' questions about the accusations that he'd failed to pay taxes in 1989. Here's what he said to the press. I haven't committed a crime. What I did was I failed to comply with the law. Miss Alabama in 1994 at the Miss Universe contest was asked this question. If you could live forever, would you and why? Now, this was her response. I would not live forever because we should not live forever. Because if we were supposed to live forever, then we would live forever. But we cannot live forever, and that's why I would not live forever. (laughs) Mayor Marion Barry of Washington, D.C. said this. Outside the killings, Washington, D.C. has one of the lowest crime rates in our country. When Senator Dale Quayle was asked, When he had been chosen to be George Bush's running mate, he was asked a question. A question about the Holocaust. And here was Dan Quell's response. The Holocaust was an obscene period in our nation's history. This century's history. We all lived in this century. Well, I didn't live in this century. See, one of the things we fear at this point is, what will I say? What if I blow it? What if I make the overture and it goes south. That's a legitimate fear. My point is, leave it in the hands of God. If you're offering the hands of reconciliation, God will offer the hand of grace. So I want you to feel the scene we're about to look at. Joseph stood there. He hasn't seen his youngest brother in 20 years. You know, one of the interesting things about, I've noticed on Facebook, is that a lot of my old people I went to high school with, they'll reach out to me Send me something, and I'll look at it, and I'll go, whoo, dude, life's been hard on you. They've aged. They don't look like that spry 15, 16, 17-year-old I knew in high school. You change over 20 years. And you can almost hear Joseph clearing his throat. Is this, because the text tells us he gets choked up. Is this, he knows who it is. Is this your youngest brother, Benjamin? He says, may God be gracious to you, my son. Newsweek, in an article entitled Home at Last, captured the the elation of the homecoming of the first POWs from Vietnam. Everything was meticulously planned. The plane landed. The the waiting brass would snap to attention. The men would disembark and proceed through an orderly reception line. But when Air Force Major Arthur Burr and four other returning POWs arrived at Andrews Air Force Base, it didn't quite work that way. The families were supposed to wait till the men disembarked and got to their position. 
Arthur Burr had been a P.O.W. for eight years, and at the first sight of her husband, Nancy Burr shrieked with happiness, and with her children in hot pursuit, streaked across the tarmac, she leaped into her husband's waiting arms. She lifted up a big bear hug embrace, and gleefully whirl, he whirled her around, and around, and around. What an awesome thing. See, Joseph wants to do that. He wants to go and grab his brother. He wants to shout. He wants to dance. There's a lot of raw emotion in this text of two brothers that have been separated by 20 years. But God is working on the heart of Joseph to become a brother of grace and not to add more guilt. Remember the words of Jesus in Luke 12. If God has been generous with you, he will expect you to serve him well. But if he has been more than generous, he will expect you to serve him even better. Those of us who've experienced the grace of God, we're supposed to give it to other people, even to the people who hurt us, either intentionally or unintentionally. God has been generous with Joseph, has taken him and promoted him to the second highest position in Egypt. So he dresses Benjamin as my son. In those days, that was a cultural thing to do like we do today. With your sons running around here, a lot of times they'll run around and I'll say, oh, have a good day, son. It just is a sign there's a difference in who's with you, okay? A sign that we're not on the same status. So when the words, God bless you, my son, the dam breaks for Joseph. He can't contain himself anymore. Look at verse 30. Then Joseph hurried from the room because he was overcome with emotions for his brother. He went into his private room where he broke down and wept. The message translation puts it this way. Deeply moved on seeing his brother and about to burst into tears, Joseph hurried out into another room and had a good cry. The Hebrew word translated as wept, brakot, means deeply moved. It means to wail, cry uncontrollably. It's the Hebrew word used when a mother wails over the death of a child. There is deep feelings. There's passionate feelings. Joseph loses it in private. He's wailing. He's crying uncontrollably. Because he hasn't seen his brother in 20 years. And this is the first time in 20 years all the brothers have been together. Chuck Swindoll tells the story of a friend of his who lost a son. His son was found drowned at the bottom of a neighbor's swimming pool. He says this man and his wife continue to grieve to this day. He said the dad said to me one day, to this day there are times we have to choke back the feelings. He said, shortly after the drownings, I blamed God. I got in my car, and I drove around the Los Angeles freeway for miles. As I did, I lashed out with words that I would have never said in the presence of anyone against God. He said, no one was there, just me and God. He said, grief and resentment and anger and confusion against God, I dumped it all. He said, after more than two hours of that, I drove back home, pulled into my driveway, turned off the engine. He said, my eyes and were still wet. My cheeks were still wet and reddened from crying and wailing so horribly against God. He said, I then laid my head against the steering wheel, and I was completely exhausted from this. He said, then I, it suddenly struck me with this thought. He said, God put this in my thought. He said, son... I will help you handle this. God is going to help Joseph handle this in a way that Joseph never could see for 20 years. And sometimes things are going to happen in your life. You can't see it right then. It looks bad. It looks horrible. But God in his grace will work it out. If you just stay out of it and let him do it, he'll work it out. God will never tell on you. Think about it. Let's say tomorrow you go in your prayer time to God and you say, God, I'm going to come back and confess this sin to you. What if you heard a voice? Well, you know, this is the hundredth time you've confessed this same sin to me. I'm tired of hearing it, and I'm not going to forgive you anymore. And besides, I've just sent an angel over to your neighbor's house to tell them the sins you're committing. He doesn't do that. He doesn't tell on us. He doesn't squill on this. I've had those times in my life where I have cried and wailed before God. Such is life, especially when you choose to be real and authentic with God and with others. You see, all of us put on this facade, we've got it all together. 
That's a big lie. None of us have it all together. The only person who has it all together is Jesus Christ. And that's the one we should turn to. Joseph, this great, powerful prime minister, admittedly is real privately. He runs away to cry. He can't, he's overcome with emotions. And when you decide to make a ruptured relationship right, realize your emotions may overwhelm you, and that's okay. Don't be afraid of your emotions, especially tears, because they're God's way of wiping away the guilt of a hurting heart. Some of you recognize the name of Washington Irving. He's the author of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. He writes this, There is a sacredness in tears. They are not the mark of weakness, but of power. They speak more eloquently than 10,000 tongues. They are messengers of overwhelming grief and unspeakable love. You will have emotions when you go to be reconciled, and that's okay. Number five, to make rupture relationships right for the glory of Jesus Christ, trust that God is for you. God's going to work this out for you. Now look at verse 30. It says, deeply moved at the sight of his brother, Joseph hurried out and looked for a place. We just read that early. So he runs out. He, he sees Benjamin, and he can't contain himself. Verse 31 says, after washing his face, he came back out, keeping himself under control. Then he ordered, bring out the food. And what's amazing to me is we read this part of the story. It almost mirrors what happened 20 years earlier. Remember when they threw Joseph in the cistern? What did the brothers do? They had a meal. He's down there screaming for his life. He wants out, and they have a meal. So he brings the brothers back in. And they have a meal. It had to be kind of a deja vu experience for him. Look at verse 32. The waiter served Joseph at his own table, and his brothers were served at a separate table. The Egyptians who ate with Joseph sat at their own table because Egyptians despised Hebrews and refused to eat with them. So verse 32 gives us a little cultural context here of how people ate back then. Joseph has his own table, his brothers are at another table, and the Egyptian servants have their own table. Now look at verse 34. You must tell him, we, your servants, have raised livestock all of our lives as our ancestors have always done. When you tell him this, he will let you live here in the region of Goshen for the Egyptians despised shepherds. In those days, Egyptians hated Hebrews. There was huge animosity between them. And so Joseph says later, when you're going to go out for me, when you leave from here, eventually, you must remember how the Egyptians despise us. And they will despise us. And Moses actually said this. Look at this in Exodus 8, 26. Moses said to Pharaoh, but Moses replied, that wouldn't be right. The Egyptians detest the sacrifices that we offer to the Lord our God. Look, if we offer our sacrifices here where the Egyptians can see us, they will. So there was huge hatred between these two groups. Now, again, this is kind of humorous for me here. And here's why. <laughs> because they sit at their separate tables. They're eating wonderful, juicy steaks. You see, we know from Egyptian culture what happens at these types of feasts. One thing was, there were girls that came in and danced for the men. Now, Moses, knowing that Baptists would read this later, left that part out, I think, okay? Look at verse 33. Joseph told each of his brothers where to sit according to their amazement. He seated them according to age, from oldest to youngest. Now, they don't know who he is. They've got to be thinking, how does he know this? How does he know the pecking order of how we were born? He sits them from oldest to youngest at the table. Henry Morris, who's a Bible scholar, says this. After they were assigned to sit at their tables, the 11 brothers noted a remarkable thing. They had been seated in order of age from the eldest through the youngest. If this were a mere coincidence, it was indeed marvelous. Because if you run the odds of this, there are 39,917 different orders which Joseph could have set these brothers. But to set them in the perfect order of their birth was miraculous. Evidently, this man had a great deal more about their family than they had realized, or else he had some kind of supernatural power, but they have no answer. They are stunned. They're shocked that he knows the pecking order. It's not enough. They're shocked again, but look at verse 34. And Joseph filled their plates with food from his own table, giving Benjamin five times as much as he gave the others, so they feasted and drank freely with him. Think about this. There's this huge spread, juicy, succulent steaks, loaded baked potatoes, Fresh garden salads, soft shell crab, juicy flounder, steamed oysters, cornbread, baked potatoes. You getting hungry? This spread for them, 
they're sitting here going, why is this man doing this? We're nobody. To me, they're shocked. They're perplexed. And Joseph instructs his stewards to give his younger brother five times the amount of food. Now, in those days, you would honor an honored guest by more. So now, as you, you may be wondering why five times, not three, not six, not ten, because just like the number seven was a sign of completion of a week, five was also a sign of completion. God created the universe in five days. Since they feasted and drank freely with Joseph. In other words, these brothers, they see no ulterior motive from him at all. They simply look at him as rewarding them for bringing their younger brother Benjamin. Literally, the Hebrew text says they were perfectly satisfied with what they ate and drank. They're beginning to realize that God's not about to punish them for what happened. But God's about to use this in a way they never could thought was possible. I want you to know that when you go to do this, when you go to be reconciled with someone, you take the initiative. God's going to be with you. He is for you. Look at Romans 8.31. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can separate us? Did you hear that? God is for us. God is for us. God is for us. Say it with me. God is for us. So you're going to have some fears like these brothers did when you take the initiative to go sit down with somebody that you know has an issue with you. God is for you. I read about on the wall of a men's room at, at a Kansas truck stop, there were scribbled these words, if God is for us, who can be against us? Someone scribbled this below it, the highway patrol. That is who can be against us. I love how Max Cicada writes about this. He says, your parents may have forgotten you. Your teachers may have neglected you. Your siblings may be ashamed of you, but not God. God is for you. Not maybe, not has been, not was, not would be, but God is for you. He is for you today, at this hour, at this minute. And as you hear me speak, no need to wait in line or come back tomorrow. He is for you. Turn to the sidelines. That's God cheering for you. Look past the finish line. That's God applauding for you. Listen to him in the bleachers, shouting your name. Too tired to continue, he'll carry you. Too discouraged to fight, he's picking you up. God is for you. He had, he, if he had a calendar, guess what? Your birthday would be on his calendar. It'd be circled and bright so he would know it was you. If he drove a car, your name would be on his bumper sticker. If there's a tree in heaven, he's carved your name in the bark. If God have have a tattoo with your name, it would be on his shoulder. Because why? God is for you. He's for you in this. Towards the end of his life, when he was suffering from the accumulated effects of a lifetime of alcoholism, W.C. Fields was discovered one day reading a Bible. An astonished friend asked him, What are you doing? W.C., you're an atheist. Why are you reading the Bible? His response was, I'm looking for loopholes. In the end, we all face Jesus Christ. And if you have someone in this room today or someone in our church that you have an issue with, you need to get it acted and respond swiftly and humbly today. If you want God's forgiveness, if you want to be like Christ, there are no loopholes to this. You can't receive God's forgiveness for your sins in the future if you don't get reconciled with someone today. I love what Ephesians 4.32 says. Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ Jesus has forgiven you. Look at Colossians 3.13. Make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Luke 6.37, Jesus said, forgive others and you will be forgiven. Jesus said this in Matthew 18. Then Peter came to him and asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who has sinned against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors was brought into him who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay his debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and released him and forgave him his debt. But the man, but when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. 
His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me, and I will repay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested, put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the king, the angry king, sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. And that's, notice what Jesus says here, that's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Do what? Have you tortured? You may not take this seriously, but our Lord does. Every time you see that person, every time their name comes up, you're going to well up with all kinds of thoughts and feelings. That's torture. God will torture you until you seek reconciliation. And here's why. Unforgiveness, turned inward, only finds a way to express itself outwardly. And I close with this. July 18th, 1984 is a day that will be remembered in San Ysidro, California, a town just outside, just on the, this side of the Mexican border. It was a beautiful sunny afternoon. It was the day that 41-year-old James Oliver Huberty entered the McDonald's at 4 p.m. and killed 22 people and injured another 19 before SWAT finally took him down. As one witness said, he would go through the crowd, picking them off one by one. Even little children on bicycles were gunned down as they tried to ride to safety. One of the injured was a newborn infant girl who's, who survived, but the youngest killed was an eight-month-old boy. So the big question in their mind's mind was, why? Why did James Oliver Huberty do it? As witnesses and family members and friends were interviewed, officials were able to put the puzzle together. As Huberty entered the McDonald's, he said, I killed thousands in Vietnam, and I'm going to kill more. In fact, as he left the house, his wife asked him where he was going, and he responded, I'm going to go kill humans. She thought he was just joking. It seems that his mother had abandoned him when he was a little boy to become a missionary to Indians, he never, and he never forgave her of that. He had never recovered from the war, nor had he learned how to cope with PTSD. Counseling had been recommended, but he felt he didn't need it. And when he did go, he didn't finish it. Everything that happened to him, he blamed on this country. And in 1982, when he lost his job due to layoffs, the newspaper states that he blamed President Ronald Reagan and the government because he believed that they were conniving against him, but only to keep the rich rich and the poor poor. James Huberty became so despondent that he even wrote to the Mexican government and applied for citizenship. When his house was searched, it was found to be complete, a complete arsenal with guns, Uzi machine guns, grenades, and etc. Yet by all appearance, he seemed like the ideal great neighbor. He loved to play with children. He seemed to be a good father and a good husband. Things started coming apart when he lost his job. As he continued to blame others for his problems, his anger, the resentment, the rage, the bitterness began to boil like lava in a volcano. When the volcano erupted and the hot lava had cooled down, 22 people were dead and 19 others injured. James Huberty snapped because he gave himself over to the torturers. I don't want that for any of you. And neither does our Lord. Seminary professor Dr. Oscar Thompson, his book, says this. If there are ruptured relationships between you and someone else, there is going to be a rupture of the flow of the Holy Spirit through your life. If relationships are right, the flow of the Holy Spirit is like an artesian well that bursts up, out, and over, and blesses everyone else. There are new, no loopholes here in dealing with this. You deal with it just like I have taught you this morning. You take the initiative. You get reconciled to them. In fact, according to John Hopkins Hospital, Holding resentment, bitterness, grudges, refusing to forgive causes all kinds of illnesses such as headaches, cancers, diabetes, heart disease, depression. Their conclusion is forgiveness heals and maintains health and reduces stress. We just wish more people believed it and did it. You are shortening your life by holding a grudge. Let it go for the glory of Jesus Christ and for the gospel because you're being watched by others. They're watching you to see, does your faith, is it real? Is it legitimate? Is the gospel true? Is Jesus Christ who he says he is? They judge you and me by our reaction to each other. Let's be a church committed to the law of grace. Let's be a church committed to the law of reconciliation. Let's don't hold any grudges. 
Let it go. And watch God grace you in ways you never thought was possible. Let's pray.